Well, thank you guys so much. This is going to be a really fun, exciting panel. It's about civic and political participation. So as you might have guessed, we're going to try to actually get you guys really participating in this panel. Um, it's great that Wendy sort of kicked us off because a big theme of this panel is that millennials are engaging beyond elections. And so what we've tried to do is have different viewpoints to talk about the different pathways and opportunities for civic, social, and political engagement beyond elections. I'm going to do a quick intro of the really, really wonderful panelists and their expertise. They're going to go around, do very brief introductions, and they're going to answer this important question that I hope you all will also think about today, which is what motivates and inspires you to do this work? First, we have Sabil Rahman, who is a Four Freedom Center Fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and in 2015 will be joining the faculty at Brooklyn Law School. We have Tiana Epps Johnson, who is at the New Organizing Institute as their Election Administration Director. We have Russell Cramnell, who is the Managing Director of Opportunity Nation. And we have Prerna Lal, who currently works as an immigration attorney at Advancing Justice Asian American Justice Center. Will you welcome me in joining them today? Oops, we're doing uh, what, what motivates Yeah, us. so they're just going to briefly introduce themselves and just say sort of, you know, what motivates or inspires them to do this work. Great. So, hi everyone, I'm Sabiel. Uh, looking forward to our discussion. Uh, just really quickly, I think for me, it's uh, both the idea of necessity, that we have to do this work in order to get to the stuff that we, we've been talking about this whole conference, and uh, possibility. I think we're at a really interesting time to reinvent our democracy. Um, hi, y'all. My name is Tiana. Um, I think what motivates and inspires me, there's a lot of things, um, but uh, both true in my personal and professional life, I find a lot of meaning in helping people learn um, so that they are more confident in navigating um, the world, and I get to do that uh, both by helping the folks that run elections build skills, uh, and the sort of end result is creating uh, more useful information for the folks that are trying to navigate the civic and political process. Uh, hi, great to be here. Um, I think you know, when I think about the opportunity divide in our country, it's especially hitting young people hard. And so I think any way that we can get them engaged to help close that's important. Um, I think people often assume we've got really robust democratic institutions, right? And they'll just be fine. They'll keep operating. We know that's actually not true. They, they are robust and they function because people work really hard to make that happen. Mm. That's been true in the past and that's true today. And we really need everyone, everybody's hands, young adults especially, um, making, continuing to feel that fire. Um, you know, we didn't get an expansion of civil rights. We didn't hold our government accountable for past abuses. Um, I, I, that didn't happen on its own. It happened because people stepped up, sometimes at great risk, to make important things happen. And so I want to see that continue to happen um, as democracy pushes forward. Hi, everyone. I'm Brenna Lau. What inspires me is uh, freedom, freedom for our communities that have been terrorized right now by the administration, uh, freedom from raids, freedom to have worker protections, and the freedom to live with our families in this country because so many of us are at risk of detention and deportations as we speak. So that inspires me to do the work that I do. Wonderful. Well, you know, I think you've, you've all raised this really important question that I think a lot of us have been struggling with, which is how do we channel and tap into this energy we see with millennials? And then we see sort of the existing institutions. And we're seeing you know, a massive lack of decline in trust in these institutions. But we're also seeing sort of it feels like the best of, you know, it's like the a tale of two cities, right? You see millennials engaging in commerce and in their social lives. And there's a lot of energy. And yet, as you've said, you know, we're not seeing the big, robust reforms of previous generations. And I, I fear that if we can't sort of tap into that you know, individual energy of millennials, that there are going to be long-term consequences for our democracy. Any of you can jump in right now. Absolutely. Well, I'll comment on that. I mean, I think 
Um, political agency and, and economic agency are often linked, right? And so if you live in a neighborhood that's unsafe um, and where you feel disconnected or you, you're working two low-paying jobs just to feed your family, um, that limits your bandwidth, right? That's, that's less time you have to volunteer or organize in a campaign or push back on some encroachment you think is unfair. And so I think to the extent we can expand economic opportunity for more people, um, that's going to benefit this political engagement conversation. Um, there's a lot of data that's just come out showing the middle class in this country basically makes the same amount of money that it did about 15 years ago. And young adults, of course, and this is in the, the handouts for the, the event today, um, are of course doing, are doing even worse, unemployed at, at very high levels. And so I think that's a piece we've also got to tackle. We've got to build strong pathways for everybody, um, and institutions have to respond to that. I think a lot of people are still locked in the mindset, you go to high school, you get a four-year college degree, and there'll be a really good job waiting for you. That's a fine path for some sliver of the public, but we need lots of other pathways too. Young adults are pushing for those, they're starting their own businesses, they're earning and learning at the same time, they're being really creative. I think your institutions have to respond to that because with that growing economic capability, then you're able to have greater political agency as well. I think it's one piece of the puzzle. Um, a lot of my focus is on sort of process and infrastructure. So um, a big portion of my work is working directly with the folks that run elections at the local level to help them develop data and technology skills to better administer elections in sort of the digital age. Um, and uh, I think that one thing that is really key to my work um, that I think helps translate to increased trust in institutions is really focusing on building relationships with the folks in these local offices that have thankless jobs and building empathy between sort of their work and the needs that they're not meeting for the folks in their community. Um, and I think that working with also an office full of millennials or young people, um, oftentimes there's a lot of frustration that happens and there's a lot of tension between that work, um, but really humanizing um, these institutions because they're made up of people uh, is tremendously impactful uh, in sort of building that trust. So most of my job involves making sure people don't get detained and deported. The numbers right now are pretty stark and telling. The President Obama has deported over two million people, more than any other president in the history of this country. So he's like the worst president we ever had for immigrants and immigration. And right now he's building baby jails in different uh, you know, parts of the country where they're housing two-year-olds just because you know, they came to this country. So all of my job involves organizing communities that are, that are very disenfranchised, that don't speak English that well, that don't have access to institutions at all to begin with. And how do we then, you know, and most of us are young and people of color, so how do we organize you know, people who are completely left out and who this country has failed completely? It's obligations to provide you know, human rights laws. How do we help those people? And so you know, my, a lot of my job has been sort of organizing outside of you know, mainstream traditional institutions to build power in immigrant communities and, and that, you know, to drive and push change through different channels and you know, to build communities that are resilient and over time you know, can sort of win. And, you know, and we had a huge win two years ago when Obama gave you know, uh, a deferral of deputation to about 500,000 young people. He didn't just wake up one day. He decided to do that, though. He was pushed to do that because young people were occupying his offices across the country and emptying them out, and he didn't know what to do about that. So he had to respond and be like, okay, I need to give a reprieve to these people, and that's how he won re-election, really. But, uh, you know, a lot of my job involves thinking of, you know, working outside the margins and, and working with people who don't have access to institutions. Yeah, just, just building on that and to your question, Holly, I think a lot of that has to do with broadening what we mean when we're talking about democracy, because I, I think there's a, a dangerous tendency to reduce it down to civic virtue and pulling the ballot box and sort of doing your duty as a citizen. I think that's completely the backwards way to think about it, right? It's really, democracy is the most, uh, kind of, it's not at all a bloodless neutral concept, right? <laughs> it's the most radical, most kind of uh, power-related idea out there. It's all about resting control of the levers of power back from people who have con have monopolized it, right? Whether that's political control in terms of who makes decisions in government or uh, economic control in terms of who shapes all of the macro forces that we've been talking about the last two days uh, about the changing nature of the economy. So it, this is kind of what I mean when I think about sort of democracy as a necessity. It's, it's not an add-on that would be great if we did. It's the only way we can get to the stuff that we've been talking about the last two days. 
So how do we do it? Sabiel, what do you think? <laughs> um, so, I mean, we've got, I mean, it's an exciting panel. We've got some great ideas already from, uh, from, from the other panelists. Um, you know, I, 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 so I mentioned before kind of the idea of, of innovation. I, I, and to my mind, I think of it both in terms of innovations around democracy, how we do it, but also mm -hmm. innovation through democracy. Mm -hmm. So um, around, innovations around democracy, I think that's about kind of going beyond uh, elections and going beyond sort of the, the modal form of uh, public participation through uh, protest or um, uh, kind of traditional forms of, of lobbying or advocacy. I mean, we're in this really exciting time where there are a, a lot of other tools, whether it's technological, um, institutional, or just kind of uh, power politics, like sit-ins and of this kind that Perna was talking about. So, you know, social movements, uh, a wider range of institutional forms outside of uh, elections and the federal government. Uh, so that's one area. And then the, the other idea of sort of de democracy as innovation, I, I'm kind of drawn to examples where uh, policymakers and stakeholders are able to co-produce uh, the policies that, that we live by. And so there aren't a, a ton of examples. It's not the way that we do things conventionally, but whether it's something like uh, participatory budgeting or, or any of the other kinds of uh, new ways we can set up to, to allow kind of a wider range of people to actually have political power instead of just making suggestions or, or kind of knocking on the door. Yeah, I would just add, um, we, there's a new report folks can find on our site that, that looks at the link between civic engagement and economic opportunity and shows very clearly that if you build skills and networks and social capital, that pays off for you with positive economic dividends, which um, is a little bit intuitive, but we have some fresh research that backs it up and tracks with some of the stuff Wendy Spencer was just saying. Our, our friends at, at, at City helped us support us in that work and I know helped make today happen too. Um, but I think one of the limitations even with the report is that we only measure kind of traditional types of engagement, right? The, the, CP, the current population survey and other data sources that we were able to look at, you know, ask you, did you volunteer in the last year? Are you a member of a group? These are important. Those are absolutely, we should never stop collecting that data, but we should collect more data because we know that more and more people, especially young people, engage in lots of other ways. And when they're asked if they volunteer, they might say no, when in fact they're doing a whole bunch of stuff that would sort of count as volunteering, but they didn't go down to like a, a service group or the, you know, the Lions Club and do that. Um, they helped their neighbor with the project or they did some online activism that then pivoted to a meetup or they did something in person and both of those linked up, or, or a hundred other things, right, that aren't sort of captured in these questions. And so our institutions, the way we gather data, sometimes aren't deft enough and, and quick enough to catch up to the way this stuff is moving so quickly. So all the ways of engagement that are being mentioned here, I think, aren't often measured and sort of counted. Um, and so young adults often seem more disconnected and less motivated than they, in fact, are by some of our institutional leaders. Yeah. And, and jumping off of that, I, I mean, I work with the most motivated young people that I've ever met in my life who work two, three jobs a day and then work at night to, like, you know, stop their families from being deported and stop everyone else's families from being deported. I mean, this is volunteer work. And, and it's something that, you know, they do around the clock and to the point where, I mean, seven years ago, I started an organization called you know, Dream Activist which was basically to organize undocumented young people across the country. And we used online tools to do so, to take action, to target congresspersons, to target you know, ICE agents, to target DHS as a whole organization, to change immigration policy in this country. And you know, through that also, we, we met other undocumented people and sort of built an organic movement from the ground up where we have so many different you know, groups of undocumented young people and now also their parents who are joining in and forming community and trying to stop ICE buses from going to Mexico. And, and you know, trying to stop deportations of people. Some some young people have taken on, you know, more. You know, they're doing sit-ins in offices, and they're doing sit-ins at ICE and locking themselves to gates. And this is all civic engagement, and this is what democracy should, you know, look like. Right. Yeah. This is very interesting. So, you know, one thing that I'm hearing is. There is a lot of civic engagement, and there is a lot of energy, but somehow it's disconnected from the perception of millennials, but also disconnected from these traditional institutions and traditional indicators when you see things like you know, declining levels of social capital around millennials. One statistic that I found very interesting is that you know millennials are not brand loyalists. This is true in commerce, and it's also true in politics. And there's a lot of political scientists who tell you, you know, party identification is a really big criteria for how people vote. But we're not actually seeing that with millennials. And one thing that they really value is solutions-based governance. 
So I'm hearing a lot of energy, a lot of excitement from you guys. How do we sort of translate that? How can we sort of bridge that divide to maybe paint a new picture for what millennial civic engagement looks like? So uh, this came up a little bit in one of our breakout groups yesterday. Um, uh, so I, I think a lot of that is actually, uh, there's a lot of potential there, right? The sort of uh, f liberation from conventional uh, brands or, or the kind of two-party system. But I think that the danger is that, uh, so I, I like the kind of solutions-oriented uh, ethos as well. I, I'm also kind of among that older edge of, of the millennial generation. <laughs> but um, I, I think the danger is that we, uh, solutions-oriented pragmatism shouldn't be taken to mean uh, neutral or non-normative, right? Because we still have values that we're arguing for very passionately. Like, we still believe in equality and justice and dignity for all. And that's, mm. those aren't neutral kind of concepts. Mm. They're, they're nonpartisan in the sense that they're not democratic or, or republican necessarily, but they're, they are very political. That's and great. so I think what we're looking for is ways to channel that moral energy, hmm. but not necessarily through the party system or legislative politics or those kinds of brands. And that's where there's a lot of new potential around new social movements, new forms of uh, institutional innovation. That's that very interesting. Yeah. Um, I also see it as an organizing challenge um, yeah. because it means that you know there has traditional institutions are not going to have the power to organize um, the folks that we're talking about, um, and there are so many reasons that like that statistic doesn't surprise me. We just released uh, a data set uh, last week looking at the composition of elected officials down to the county level. Um, spoiler alert: white dudes. Um, <laughs> 90% of elected officials from the top to the bottom are white. 68% uh, are men. Uh, so what that translates to is that uh, we're releasing the index that's coming out next week. Folks that women of color like myself, uh, pr proportionate to the population, uh, me white men have eight times the power that they should have. Mm. Um, and so it's really difficult to think in sort of yeah. these traditional pathways, like where's my place in that? Right. Um, and so that's where sort of the innovation comes to figure out the pathway there. I agree, and I think also you could have a disproportionate impact at local at the local level, right? Turnout levels tend to be sure. much lower. I mean, young adults could could swing those elections if they all came out, right? And, I mean, so could any other age group. It, people hang back more because our media gives a disproportionate amount of coverage to our binary presidential choice every four years, right? And that's incredibly important. And the president makes a lot of decisions that impact all of us. Um, but and we saw this sort of in Ferguson, right? In fact, these things will flare up, and it's like, wait, how did this happen? How did the leadership structure locally not reflect the community? And how are these all these abusive practices, and then you go back and look at turnout levels. And again, it's not all about voting. It's about a whole range of engagement across many, many months of accountability. You can't show up once and vote and, and be done, as we've been saying. But um, I think that's a place where people could make a bigger impact, both to influence the people currently holding office and to change the composition of those people, as was just said, so that they do reflect the community a little bit more. So I would say to dig in there, too, locally. Yeah, I think that's also pretty exciting that you know young people tend to be more independent than, than anything else. I mean, it means for me, at least in my work, it means that you know politicians are not going to take Latinos and Asians as granted to be vote for Democrats because they're the ones that are running the worst policies imaginable right now, at least in, in office. So it's it's actually a pretty exciting time, and as far as opportunities to sort of play one party against another <laughs> by, by you know pretty much saying you're independent, so hey, you need to do what we really want you to do. Uh, so, and that's, that's been, you know, it's actually helped to grow our power in, in that manner. So, I see it as a very positive thing, actually. Hmm. That's very, that's very hopeful. That's, that's rather uplifting because, you know, I think you're right. You know, one, one thing that makes me concerned is that the world in which we live in does not yet reflect these realities. And so we have this two-party system. And so I like this idea of sort of seeing the system for what it is and then trying to understand how do we work with it to achieve our own goals. Do the other panelists have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I guess two, two quick things. One, just to add to that last round around uh, the lack of diversity in kind of the composition of who makes decisions. It's also, there's also a really big uh, class problem right, in terms of the, the types of life experiences that people have by the time they either become elected or, or, or appointed officials of various kinds. But, but to your question, um, you know, I, I do think it's, it's hopeful, and one way to, to think about it is so a lot of the institutions we now take as given around how our democracy works were themselves the product of previous attempts to reinvent 
the process under extreme duress. So whether it's direct election of senators yeah. or uh, party primaries, I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. those came out of the response to the first Gilded Age, oh, yeah. you know, 100 years ago when uh, people were concerned about machine politics as kind of choking off yeah. The, sort of the ideal of democracy, right? And so um, now a lot of those institutions maybe don't seem quite as vibrant or a, as, as valuable to, a, to us at this point, but I think it's worth remembering that these things aren't given. They don't come bequeathed from, they certainly don't come from the Constitution and then they, they don't come from sort of, uh, any kind of from on high, they come from history. They're the product of people like us in previous generations trying to battle out uh, the kinds of problems that we're facing now. Um, I just think that there is a ton of opportunity there um, to the extent for folks that do have access to institutions to work with and work within um, government. Uh, and I'm not just talking about sort of running for elected office, although that's like one pathway certainly, but um, the folks that I work with are public servants that uh, are working at the local level and significantly impacting or have the potential to significantly impact and engage their communities. Um, and uh, these are the types of opportunities that I hope increasingly young people are engaged in as well. Yeah, I just amen to all that. I think, I think this is exactly right. And I think there's a, there's a huge, huge power in, in telling your story and marrying it with data. I think some people are more responsive to the head and some more to the heart. I think you really need both. I, I always tell people, you know, come in with hard and fast numbers and your sort of personal experience. Because um, the, the comment about the fact that uh, our leadership does not reflect people's experiences, certainly not uh, racially, but also um, the, the income divide is actually pretty, pretty huge. It's extremely rare for a low-income person to have the, the capital and the extra time and, and obviously the money uh, given through their network to run for office. I mean, that's just, it's almost a, a laughable concept. And so um, I think telling those stories to people about, you know, what is it like to to live in some of the neighborhoods in this country where zip code ends up being a huge, huge determinant of outcomes. I mean, nobody w sort of wants to believe that because uh, the American dream is such a powerful socializing force in all of our lives. But in fact, we know there's a massive divide in our country, um, even among young adults, right? There's about a third of young adults that could, that could make some pretty big problems. Uh, some pretty big mistakes and probably be okay, right? Because they have mm -hmm. networks around them. They have really engaged parents. Yeah. Um, they have really robust networks that are gonna that are gonna pick them back up. And then there's a third of young adults that can do everything right, and it would be really, really tough to move up because they live in a neighborhood where there are no supports, there are no caring adults in their life, and there's no cushion when they make a mistake. Um, one mistake could could really sort of be it for them, or could set them way back on their on their pathway. And then and then there's probably a third in the middle that um, that obviously have a, a more of a mixed experience. You know, that's not the country we want to live in, of course, and, and nobody wants that. Um, and so I would say bring that story to people, even to very unusual allies that you do not think would support you. Bring that story to them and let them react authentically in the moment, because I think that's a very compelling narrative that we all want to turn around, um, whether you run a big business or whether you're liberal or conservative or whatever. Fantastic. Um, I want to do one quick last question and then open it up for questions. So if there was just you know one thing that you think you'd want to sort of convey to millennials writ large. Let's say we can't win the media war, right? And there are some constituencies where it's easier to show the impact of policy. And I think the, the turn, the re-interest in cities and local level is very exciting because people can be more connected to that. What's one way that you, know, you guys think we could sort of show millennials that there is this opportunity here? And you can think about it if you want to take the questions first before you come back to this. I mean, the one thing that I would say, you know, that drives a lot of my work is that people who are most directly impacted should be the ones that lead their own struggle. And so many times, our institutions, especially in DC, don't facilitate that. Right. I mean, we have so many immigrant rights organizations in DC that are not ran by non-immigrants. You know, it's like, you were born here, what do you know about this? But, I mean, this is a problem throughout, you know, like different communities mm -hmm. and, and different places. Like workers should lead their own struggle, obviously. It's, it barely, hardly ever happens though. So I think one of the takeaways that I would say is to try to facilitate people, you know, leading themselves mm -hmm. and leading their own communities. I think that's self-governance. Right. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I think that like showing millennials is like not, 
really a thing that is necessarily possible, but understanding sort of the relationship between uh, your agency and your power um, and sort of the pathway to impact and hold accountable institutions is like one piece, but then actually getting involved and diving in and doing that and seeing your own power uh, is sort of the only, one of the only ways to do that. I would just say this may sound cheesy, maintaining optimism. I mean, millennials having come of age in a really difficult economic climate, I think still polling shows they're still very optimistic. Yeah. I think this sense of possibility, like, great, the Obama campaign did a bunch of innovative things for the first time um, around social media and the way they engage people. That's now a floor. Like, that's no longer a gold standard. Like, we can, we can now do better than that, and young adults will be showing the way. So I think that sense of possibility and, and these new types of engagement um, and showing the country that optimism, even in, the sp even in the face of real economic obstacles, I think is, is incredibly powerful. Um, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Please be brief. As you know, this has been such an exciting panel, and we want to get the panelists to really have a discussion. OK, that, that person there, please say your name and your brief question. Thank you. Hi, my name is George Chung. I'm from the Joyce Foundation. I'm really intrigued about uh, your thoughts about the two-party political system. Uh, one could definitely play the two parties against each other, or one could really shift towards some systemic reforms towards a real multi-party system through proportional representation. So I'd love to get your thoughts in terms of should young people and millennials lead the charge in terms of shifting to a multi-party system? Great, thank you. Fantastic question. Um, sure. Good. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, so in theory, uh, if you can get bills, a bill through the state legislature, you can have states allocate their house seats proportionally. Um, there's no, there's no reason why we have to have single member districts. Uh, and it would change a lot of the dynamics. I, I, I'm not sure how likely that is. I, I tend to see the party system as being fundamentally lagging and responsive to where, to other sources of uh, political initiative. So if it's a choice of strategy, right, I think I would lean more towards the social movement kind of emphasis that changing the, changing the baseline against which parties have to respond uh, but if you know, if we're kind of dreaming structural uh, changes, then yeah, I mean, a kind of a PR system would be great. Mm -hmm. I agree too. And there are some states that have nonpartisan panels that draw their congressional boundaries. You know, every state should, should do that, right? Like that's another thing. You don't have to overthrow the two-party system. You can change uh, the gerrymandering that we have. That wouldn't fix everything at all because we still sort ourselves. Liberals tend to live in cities, and so their vote will always be diluted. So there's some structural things there based on where people choose to live. But um, if we ungerrymandered um, all the congressional lines, that would make a lot more competitive districts, and that would allow you to play the parties off of each other more because you'd have uh, even. If if we stuck with a two-party system, you'd have two more uh, reasonable people running against each other, presumably, once the lag caught up. Yeah. I mean, I come from a parliamentary democracy, so I mean, mm -hmm. I know the potential mm -hmm. in a democracy where you have 10 different parties running for election, and you can actually just have a no-confidence motion and like take, get rid of them the next week. <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, I'm the, I'm the, <laughs> it's the best thing ever. And it's, it's kind of shocking to me how the U.S. is supposed to be some sort of a democracy, but you like have two parties that do the same thing. It's kind of ludicrous. Uh, so, I mean, yes. I mean, ideally, we would love to see you know a kind of vibrant government where people you know actually are proportionately represented. Obviously, uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever get there, though. <laughs> no. um, we'll take another question. That gentleman over there. Hi, first off, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Nehemiah Roll. I work with the Roosevelt Institute Campus Network. Um, my question is, how do we frame the conversation around values-oriented governance to kind of constructively communicate across difference? To, co to communicate across To difference. constructively communicate across difference. Yeah. So uh, just, uh, I'll throw out a, a, maybe a quick thought on that. I mean, I, I think a lot of what, so if you think a lot about what we talked about yesterday and this morning, right, about the changing nature of the economy. Um, to my mind, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a source of the problem that's really about economic power and domination, right? And, and I think that's a, it's not universal, but it's, it's a very, it's a much broader, more capacious language, right? We're all trying to have uh, agency over our own lives as individuals, as communities, and we're constrained in that by concentrated uh, private power by the forces of the market 
um, and, and these are kinds of economic power that are sort of taking decisions out from uh, out from our own control, right? And I, don't know, I think there's room there to be able to engage a lot of different types of of communities and experiences around a, co a kind of a common cause, uh, you know, in terms of remaking the economy, remaking our political system. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of potential to think sort of past the framework of difference and more about intersections. Mm -hmm. And I think that a real way to sort of recognize those intersections has to do with telling the stories, sort of what you had talked about before, telling your own personal stories and sort of seeing, building relationships with other folks sort of more based on these commonalities and building empathy with them. Um, we'll take another question. Uh, that gentleman in the, in the blue, Mr. Mark Schmidt. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Mark Schmidt with New America. I'm just wondering, suppose there was somebody on the panel who said, hey, you know what? Us, you know, millennials, we're libertarians, we're techno-libertarians, we don't need government, we work things out for themselves, for ourselves. What would be your response to imaginary panelist number six? <sighs> Spicy. <laughs> I, I, before we disagree with me, I don't think the polling supports that. I mean, I don't. I mean, are there libertarians in the millennial cohort? Sure, just like there are in every age cohort. And um, you know, and maybe those voices are particularly loud and interesting. Uh, but I think most of the polling shows millennials are pretty comfortable with government having a role. In some cases, a substantial role. Now, I think they they want business to have some freedom, especially in the entrepreneurship space. They don't want to see lots of regulation. So there's always caveats. But I think in general, millennials answer questions about their comfort with the size of government being that they're, they're pretty okay with it. So and, and, um, I, I, I think that's right, but to take the, the kind of our hypothetical libertarian on, I mean, I, I, I would say two things. So, so first of all, I think there's a difference between um, being a, a hardcore libertarian of the, uh, of the sort where the market solves everything and, and we, we're anti-state versus being uh, someone kind of leading libertarian in the sense that they, the idea of individual creativity um, and innovation, entrepreneurship, those are things that appeal to them. Um, and that latter, I think, is actually totally right because um, there are a lot of ways in which we've talked about that are kind of traditional, like the traditional liberal imagination of government solving problems. Just, it actually doesn't work the way we want it to work. And I think as progressives, you have to take that on and, and be like, yeah, that's actually a real problem, but the answer isn't to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The answer is to like tap our entrepreneurial, creative intuitions and use that to reinvent our institutions of government because the, the extra piece is that all of the problems we talked about today and, and yesterday are problems that we can't solve individually. You can't, be, you can't as an individual entrepreneur, solve the, the, the work-life balance problem or solve the debt problem or solve uh, the lifetime kind of wealth accumulation problem or any of the things we talked about. Those are collective problems that require collective action, but we shouldn't constrain ourselves to sticking with the institutions and the toolkits that we have, that we've inherited, because they actually don't work very well. Yeah. You know, and just to sort of take that question on in a serious way, I, I do think it is something that we are going to have to sort of have a good answer for, because I think the, some of the folks uh, that I, some of my best friends, it's not that they don't want a lot of the benefits that we all see, it's that they want sort of alternative structures to provide them those benefits. And I think there really is going to be a tension in this idea of solution-based governance and how, what do we do for the public sector and the public servants who have been there. And I think it is going to force us to sort of come into reality with some of these tensions. And I think we're going to see it in the up to 2016. I think we have time for a few more questions. These have all been really fantastic. Um, let's take this woman here and then the woman behind her. You can either order, that's fine. Good morning, Mary Bruce with AmeriCorps alums. Wondering, um, technology is a solution versus or in complement with actually sitting down and talking to people face to face. And, and we, we talked a bit about the Obama campaign and the power that technology played in his election, but it was also house parties and people actually sitting and talking about real issues. So as you're thinking about millennials who are more mobile than previous generations and leveraging technology and place-based solutions versus or in complement with technology solutions. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that there are, I, I think sometimes uh, older adults or institutions think, oh, if we just have the right tech solution, like we'll engage the young people, like, and just, <laughs> they sort of check that box and think that they're sort of done then. But I think you clearly need both. I mean, high tech and high touch both are important. I mean, right, the Obama campaign succeeded. They did a lot of tech stuff. They also had an army, like the biggest organizing army ever, right? They had more people on the ground doing door knocking. The number of contacts they were reporting to their field operation was, was off the charts. And so I, I, I think they're complementary. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree that technology is among the things in your toolbox to be able to more effectively engage. Uh, it's one of the many tactics that you should be Could you say that one more time? Really technology loudly. is among one of the tools in your toolbox. <laughs> Wonderful. We're going to take our final question. Is there anyone else? Because we could combine two. OK, we're good. Just trying to engage, folks. Great. Thank you. My name is Angelica. So this is for all the panelists. Um, when we talk about political participation, you know, we do all, I feel like, tend to look at civic innovation and the role of technology. But at the end of the day, a fundamental right we have is to vote. Um, and what are your thoughts on increasing voter participation, particularly amongst millennials? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that first. Uh, our political system is so complicated, it's criminal. Um, <laughs> one of the things that uh, I've specifically worked on um, is that uh, recognizing that technology is among one of the tools to better engage uh, young people. Um, Local election offices uh, of the just over 3,000 counties, about 1,000 counties don't have an elections website at all, um, which was shocking to me. Um, and so one of the things that I have worked on um, to help make sure that folks have the information that they need for the fundamental baseline things to know how to even get to the ballot box and vote um, ha has been working uh, to develop uh, sort of this website template for local election offices based in a bunch of best practices about how people consume election information uh, and helping to coach those folks in those offices to know how to actually populate and maintain and write in plain language and all of the things that are helpful to mm -hmm. communicating that information as just one of the mechanisms of helping demystify the process and actually meet people where they're looking for this. Yeah, I would like to just you know, note most of the people I work with don't have the right to vote. I mean, there's like, you're talking about 20 million people who actually can't vote. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not just because they're immigrants, but also because, you know, there's found disenfranchisement. There's also, you know, ways of preventing people from voting nowadays through voter ID laws. And so a lot of this involves fighting back and actually trying to gain either the right to work or, you know, to put it in a different manner or to cast it differently, making sure that everyone can vote regardless of the immigration status or regardless of, you know, the fact that they might have a criminal record or any of those things. So it's to actually you have to extend the vote, right? And then we do it in ways that, that also promote more civic participation beyond just voting. Yeah, just just to build on that, I, I think both of those are, are really spot on. I mean, it's, um, we have all, it, we have all the tools at our disposal to kind of up the participation rate in terms of like you know whether it's websites out online you know direct mail but uh, I mean I, I think the, the problem of voter turnout it's it's much more political than that right I mean we're living through the worst retrenchment of uh, of the right to vote since Jim Crow arguably even worse depending on how you count between felon disenfranchisement immigrants and like the new voter ID laws and it's happening like literally in real time in the last two weeks it's gotten even worse with the series of court decisions so I mean it's happening right now we're living through it and and it's a total outrage but like that's to my mind, that's the real, like, let's make it, it's not just a civic virtue thing, right, that we have to turn up and vote. Like, no, there's actual power being exercised here mm -hmm. in a really immoral way, uh, and that should be the story. Yeah, I, I just want to completely agree with that. And this is, I don't think this is, um, my organization is completely bipartisan. We work with everybody, work with all sectors, um, and I don't think this should be controversial to say, you know, the, the voter ID stuff that's going on is, is just clearly wrong. I would commend to everybody in the room, uh, Judge Richard Posner, who's a conservative, yeah on the federal bench just wrote this opinion if you haven't seen it recently in one of the and maybe the one in Wisconsin but in one of the contested laws his decision basically eviscerated every argument that you could make for supporting these voter ID laws step by step it's 
beautifully written. I, I would suggest that you read it and share it. So it's really powerful. And, and coming from someone who sits on the right side of the ideological spectrum from him, um, it basically knocks it down. This is about our sort of values as a country. And the second thing I would add, uh, since we're sitting right now in the district and I'm a resident of the city, and many of you <laughs> probably are, um, we could do for president, but, that, but that's it. And so I think there's also uh, fundamental injustice happening that there are 650,000 people who pay taxes and fight in wars that don't get to vote um, in this city as well. So I would just mention those two. Those should not be controversial statements. Proud to work with liberals and conservatives at our organization and think that those two things are, are true. Fantastic. Well, you know, I just want to say, you know, I think about this stuff a lot, and this panel totally blew me away. And I want to thank all of you, both for all the work you're doing and also for all the great ideas and energy you put forth today. So a big round of applause and wonderful questions. Thank you, guys. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did.